In order to properly understand the context of Revelation, we must first understand the stage in which it plays out on. It is very crucial to understand one solid piece of information. The very first Christian community firmly believed Jesus would return within one generation. The author of Revelation reminds us of this when he writes, For the time is at hand. At hand is meaning now. But why did the very first Christians believe this? In the book of Matthew, it is written that Jesus said so, clearly and without any room for speculation. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus is saying without mistake that some of the people he is physically speaking to in person would be alive when he returns with his kingdom descending down from the clouds. Obviously, this verse causes a believer to squirm and attempt to reinterpret what has been written. A Christian apologist had once tried to explain to me how I was taking this verse out of context and misunderstanding it. He said to me, All you have to do is read into the next chapter to understand what Jesus is really saying. He tells me that in chapter 17, Jesus performs a transfiguration, whereas he glows like a spirit and is speaking with the ghosts of Moses and Elijah. This, he assures me, is the kingdom of which Jesus is speaking about here in Matthew 16. Ironically, he had accused me of taking the verse out of context but it is actually the apologist who is doing so. Let's examine the context of this verse by reading the verse before it. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with the angels, the second coming. And then he shall reward every man according to his works, the final judgment. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Second Coming These verses 27 and 28 are together in context. Jesus says he will return with all of the angels. The transfiguration story fails here. Jesus also says that at this time, every man will be judged and rewarded or punished. The transfiguration story fails here as well. Also, note that by moving into the next chapter, 17, verse 1 is moving us forward in time six days from the returning soon kingdom speech. Why would Jesus say, some here will not taste of death until this happens, if he is talking about only six days later for his transfiguration? This would make Jesus out to be a complete idiot. Some of you might not die before six days. Folks, this is ludicrous. Jesus is talking about his magical kingdom with all of the angels in the final judgment within their generation. He was not referring to six days later when he transfigures. Furthermore, any time that Jesus speaks of the kingdom, he is always referring to the end of days. The very interesting thing I have found about Bible prophecies, from the Old Testament to the New, is how they always fail, but over time, they just keep getting reinterpreted. Christians will seamlessly twist any fail into a metaphor or provide new meaning, rather than accept the obvious. 
If they don't, then Jesus right here in these verses was wrong. Christians can't have this. Jesus wrong? About his own prophecy? Can't have that. Some apologists have also referred me to Jesus reappearing to the 500 after his resurrection as to what these verses are meaning. All of the same points I presented here work in the exact same way against this apology as well. The apologetics fail to meet a standard for credibility. The New Testament failed. Ironically, Matthew 16 is not the only place where Christians encounter this problem. It keeps reoccurring throughout the New Testament. The author of Luke uses the entire chapter of 21 to reveal all of the signs to look for upon Jesus' return, and even puts them into a parable about a fig tree whose blossoms reveal when it is time. He then wraps it all up with these words, I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Clearly not the truth. Folks, I don't care if believers throw a bus of apologetics at these verses. These New Testament prophecies were simply wrong. All of them. In a letter from Paul, we read, We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. Paul is referring to himself and his group of believers being alive on earth when Jesus returns for the second time with his kingdom. Paul places such a strong emphasis on this belief that he advises his followers not to get married, to neglect the needs of your wife if you are married, not to be happy or sad, or to even care about your possessions because the time is now, right now, indicated by many of his letters. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoiced not, and they that buy as though they possessed not. Paul believed the time was so short that believers must drastically alter the way they live. Paul would never have written in this way if he did not believe it would occur within a few short years. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, Even now, many antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Many of what Christians would call antichrists were known as false messiahs. And history confirms that a messiah buzz was at its height during 30 AD, and that these prophetic messiahs had indeed appeared plentiful during the time these books were written. Jesus was not the only one seeking the title. He was just the one who had won a popularity contest, the winner for the American Idol of Messiahs, was Jesus. A very common name at that time, by the way. Here is how the author of 1 Peter says it. He was revealed in these last times for your sake. The expression used here, these last times, is present tense, meaning they were living in it, the last hour. There is no mistaking here, my friends. These statements found throughout the New Testament are indicating that neither Jesus nor these authors are addressing anyone living thousands of years later. See also Luke 9.27, Mark 9.1, and 1 Corinthians 7.29.
the New Testament has clearly made its point, and these authors were not being metaphorical. They were all stating clearly exactly what they meant to say, and they were all wrong. To make this problem even worse, the next generation of Christians began to question why Jesus had not returned yet. The first generation were dying, and Jesus has not delivered on his promise. It's rather interesting how not only the prophecies, but the promises of this God never come to pass. Oddly enough, the entire reason Jesus had to return for a second time is because he didn't fulfill prophecies in the first place. How ironic. Regardless, people were beginning to ask, where is he? Everybody is passing away, but Jesus has not returned yet. As if it could not get any crazier, the New Testament actually addresses this issue for us. Wow! A later Christian scribe had to respond to this question in a letter written to the churches. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Unfortunately, this excuse that was shoveled out for the concerns of a first century church due to failed prophecy has become a headache for the church existing today. God is being patient because he doesn't want anyone to perish? We now know that generation upon generation of non-believers have outnumbered Christians by a giant margin. If this is the reason given for why Jesus did not return soon, that he is not wanting any to perish, it just might be God's biggest blunder of all time. Non-believers are racking up as the majority for every thousand upon thousands of years he waits. This excuse is also in direct contradiction for what Jesus actually said. The road to salvation is narrow. Why would Jesus be waiting if he knows by doing so billions upon billions more people will go to hell? Folks, none of this makes any sense until you acknowledge the truth that the New Testament failed. Perhaps this should lead us to start investigating if all of the fantastic miracles and magical tales that make up the New Testament are even credible. By the time this prophecy of Jesus returning within one generation had been fully accepted by all first century believers, and copies upon copies of Christian literature had been spread about, it was too late for a second century church to alter them. Christians have been stuck with this dilemma ever since. After many generations had passed with no return of Jesus, Christians began to change theology and buckle down for the long haul. The recommendations provided for by Paul became obsolete, whereas no longer would Christians disregard money or materialism, but contrary to the early gospel message, Christians would now begin to embrace jobs, tend to their families, and emphasize financial success. Understanding that the early Christian leaders believed Jesus would return within their lifetimes is very critical information to help us set the stage for the book of Revelation. That stage in which this prophetic book was written on was set in the author's own time, in his generation, and speaks about people and places during the author's own day as he reminds his readers, And behold, I come 
quickly. In part two of this video, I will reveal to you clearly who and what is the Beast of Revelation. Stay strong and wise, my friends. I don't believe in masquerades. I don't believe that you're okay. I don't believe that God will save.